having me today. Yes. Thank you for coming, Sarah. I'm so excited because so Sarah is um, renting space in our clinic. So she's her own little practice across the hall from me. We are across the room or across the hall right now. <laughs> Luckily, we're not echoing. Um, and she, I, I have not been pregnant. I've not had a baby. So I don't know all the, there are things to know there is about lactation um, support in that world of pumping and breastfeeding, anything. So and I feel like the recurring theme is that most of my patients over the last five years don't either. And then they are postpartum. They've got all this other crap going on, like taking care of a live human. Mm-hmm. And then they're trying to breastfeed or pump or navigate those things. And maybe they only saw someone one time in the hospital, but they have nowhere else to go. Or maybe they are just like breastfeeding is not for me or pumping is not for me, but maybe you just didn't have the support you needed. So that's why I wanted Sarah to come on and talk to you guys today to give you a little bit of a heads up of maybe things to look out for. Um, so maybe tips and ideas, um, during your pregnancy, what to, you know, watch for, if you do need to go see someone and whatnot. So I will let Sarah take over. All right. Well, thanks Morgan for having me today. Hello everyone. My name is Sarah Brock. I am an international board certified lactation consultant. So the short uh, for that is IBCLC and that is an international certification. It's the highest uh, lactation certification you can get worldwide. Just a little bit about me. I have two kiddos of my own, a six-year-old and an almost four-year-old. Um, before I became a lactation consultant, I was actually in the market research world. Um, and I did, um, I was a project manager there. So I really spiraled into lactation as a lot of people do actually, because of my own experiences. I had a lot of issues with my son, like a lot, like cracked and bleeding nipples. We had to use a nipple shield. It was not fun. I was very unprepared. Um, my thought process, as I've learned a lot of, uh, women's and pregnant people's thought process is how hard can it be? It's natural, right? Oh, my mom breastfed three kids. I'll be fine. Um, but the hard thing about that is that while breastfeeding is natural, it's not necessarily easy. Some people do have it easy. Sometimes that baby comes out, latches right on and people don't have a lot of issues, I don't get to see those people. (laughs) Unfortunately, most of the time I see the people who are having issues, uh, which would make sense. So I see people in my clinic um, here where across from Morgan, like she said, I see people in their homes and I also do virtual consults. So um, I'll tell you more about my services toward the end, but I wanted to give you guys information. I'm going to take you a little bit through some things that I think that every pregnant person um, needs to know before they have a baby. Um, So if you wanna throw in the chat, let me know, have you taken any sort of prenatal breastfeeding course or are you planning to? You're all pretty early in pregnancy, so maybe it's not something you've thought of or maybe um, it's, you know, maybe it's coming up and you haven't, you just haven't taken it yet. So let me know if you've taken it. So Megan said, would like to, you need a recommendation of a good one. So I actually have one, um, a prenatal course. I have a pre-recorded version and I also have one that's live virtual coming up at the end of the month. I believe it's the last Tuesday. I'm wanting to say that's the 27th. Um, It's $27. Prenatal education is something that is so important and so easily overlooked for most people because they just don't think they need it or they think, oh, I'll deal with the issues when uh, I get there. And then like, like Morgan mentioned, you're pretty much in this world. You're like, oh my gosh, I just had a baby. I'm trying to recover from a C-section or a vaginal birth. Um, Oh, sorry. I think that may have been my papers, Morgan, (laughs) the swishing around sound. Um, Anyway, people tend to think that they don't need a prenatal course because um, they they are like, I'll just deal with the issues as they come. Um, I was very much in that world, so I totally understand. But I do have a prenatal course um, coming up, and I will share more about that later. So it looks like some of you have taken them, um, some of them with a previous pregnancy, some, some not. So I'll talk about that more a little bit later, and then I can even send you information on it if you're interested. 
Okay, so what I want to go over today, um, I have 10 things listed, may not get to them all, but if you, I have, if you have questions as we go, I'd love to hear questions, but I have 10 things that a pregnant person needs to know, to know before the baby comes. So the first one that I already mentioned, breastfeeding is natural, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be easy. So like I said, sometimes it is, sometimes it is not. It is a skill that both mom and baby have to learn um, because you've never done it before. Babies start sucking in utero um, around 12 weeks gestation. So they are sucking, but once they come out, they have to transition to the world and learn how to suck, swallow, and breathe in rhythm. And that literally begins right after they come out. They'll come out i will put them on you and then within the first hour, hopefully, as long as mom and baby are both good, they will get that baby latched on to nurse. <clears throat> so again, something that you have to learn, both you and baby, and it can take some time. Sometimes it, become, it comes more easily to some people. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to figure out. Babies eat every two to three hours around the clock and sometimes more often than that. It's very common and normal for babies to eat like 10, 12, sometimes a little bit more than that times uh, in a 24 hour period. Um, if your baby though is eating like every hour for an extended period of time, or you literally feel like all you're doing is feeding, that would be an indication to come and get help and figure out what might be going on. But They'll tell you in the hospital when that baby comes out to wake them by the three hour mark to feed or um, feed them whenever they wake up. So we call that on cue or on demand. So the third thing that, we, that I want you to know is if you want a good milk supply, you have to remove that milk. And so that means you have to keep putting baby to breast, or you have to keep pumping every three hours. This is really, 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 really important, especially in the first month of life, because your body, every time you put that baby to breast or every time you remove milk with a pump, you're laying down more receptors in your breast to help your milk supply later on. The first month is prime time to lay as many receptors as possible so that you can have a more healthy um, milk supply later on. So that's why it's important to make sure that A, your flange is fitted correctly and you're actually removing milk efficiently if you're pumping a lot, and B, to make sure the baby is actually getting on and removing milk. Um, by a show of hands or a chime in or type in the chat, how many of you have actually seen a baby feed? Have you seen a baby feed at the breast? Yeah. A lot of people, Morgan said she has, a lot of people haven't. Um, and that's not uncommon in our culture because we have this stigma around breasts. Breasts are very sexualized in our culture and it's becoming less so. Um, if you have not seen a baby breastfeed, maybe find a video on the internet or <laughs> if you have family or friends in your life and they happen to be breastfeeding, I mean, it may sound a little bit weird, but you'd be like, hey, I wanna understand what this looks like. The more we can get an idea of what breastfeeding actually is about, what it looks like, um, the more we're gonna understand that. Um, one thing you could do is if you are able to, I have a support group. It is in the middle of the day on Wednesdays, the second and fourth Wednesday of the month, but you are welcome to join at our support group, um, even when you're pregnant um, and just learn and hang out and see kind of what breastfeeding can look like. It's different for everyone and everyone has a different journey that works for them or a different journey that just kind of happened to them. So it's interesting to learn about all perspectives in that way. One thing I know one person asked about mastitis in the early weeks. I want to address this while I'm thinking about supply. So mastitis is common. Mastitis is an infection in the breast. It literally stands for milk stasis. It often happens either when a milk duct, there's a, there's a clog in the milk duct. Um, and so that milk isn't moving. And so basically it causes an infection. Your breast would become very, very tender in one certain spot and very red. Um, and you'll generally feel like you got hit by a truck. So fever, fatigue, um, 
you, you'll just feel very terrible and it's not fun and it can turn bad quickly. So you want to try to avoid it. And if you feel like you have symptoms, call your doctor right away to get medicine for it. The other way it can happen is if you have any damage on your nipple, you can get mastitis that way where the bacteria gets in that way and also causes mastitis. So one reason that mastitis happens uh, frequently in the first couple of weeks postpartum is because when your milk comes in, if you're not feeding baby often enough, if, or if baby or the pump isn't being as effective as they need to be, that can cause mastitis because the milk is again, staying in the breast and not getting out like it needs to. So besides keeping the milk moving, making sure that you're not wearing super restrictive clothing. So if you have pump bras or tank tops, ideally they don't have underwire in them. Or if you have underwire pump bras, cut the underwire out. Anything that is pressed up against your breasts is going to constrict those milk ducts and can cause um, clogged ducts. It can cause mastitis, all of those things. Any questions so far before I move on? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. One thing a lot of women hear is that breastfeeding hurts. You've probably heard that from someone or read it somewhere. Breastfeeding should not hurt. It just shouldn't. Think about it in the context of our world and how long women have been breastfeeding for. If breastfeeding hurt, then women would not want to do it. Um, and we would not have survived as a species up until now. I mean, obviously we have formula now, which is a great alternative baby um, milk that we can use and it saves a lot of babies' lives. But before formula existed, if we couldn't feed our babies at the breast and it was uh, painful, then it, like it, we wouldn't have survived, right? So you might have some soreness in the first few days or the first week of life. Um, that can often be alleviated by coconut oil, like literally the kind that you have in your pantry or your own breast milk expressed and rubbed on your nipples. But if you're having a pinchy pain, if you're having cracking and bleeding, if you're having blisters, if you're dreading feedings because you it's so painful for you, you definitely need to reach out to a lactation consultant and get some help because something's not right. Oftentimes we just have to get the latch a little bit wider, um, but other times there's something, go there's something else going on. Um, one thing that sometimes can go on is a tongue tie and those are controversial a little bit here and there. If you hear that tongue ties are just a fad, that is a myth. Tongue ties have been around for centuries. Um, they're more common right now because breastfeeding is on an upswing more people are breastfeeding, more people are finding tongue ties because oftentimes if it is going to hurt, like the first time you find it is whenever it's hurting breastfeeding. But there's a lot of people who have tongue ties that have lived with them forever and maybe they didn't cause issues with breastfeeding or maybe that person wasn't breastfed, um, but then there's other issues that can come up because of them. So if you suspect, if you go online and you're like, what does, what's symptoms of a tongue tie? And you suspect your baby has one. And then you go to a provider and they're like, they take a peek and they're like, no, I don't see anything. But you still think your baby has an issue? Get a second opinion and find someone who will do a gloved finger assessment. That's what I do in my office for every consult. I will do an oral function exam to rule out any sort of um, oral tie, oral dysfunction. I cannot diagnose, but I refer out when I suspect that there's something going on. Um, so I wanted to address that just so that I can debunk the myth that it's a fad because it's not a fad. Can you uh, elaborate what a tie is? Sorry, I'm new to this. So like, yeah. what is the actual condition? Yeah, so good question. I'm glad you brought that up. So we all have frenulum under our tongue under our upper lip here, under this lip. And some people even end up having buckle ties, which are in their cheeks. And so frenula are a normal part of anatomy. When the frenula restricts or anyway impacts function, that's when it's considered a tongue tie. So for example, in order for a baby to breastfeed, that baby has to be able to stick their tongue in and out, lateralize back and forth, 
lift the tongue to the top of the mouth and then be able to cup and hold a suction um, on the breast or the bottle. Um, and so it, when a baby can't do one of those, like say baby can stick their tongue out, but then you notice they are not lifting their, their tongue to the top of their mouth, or maybe they can stick their tongue out, but when they're feeding on the bottle or the breast, they're constantly making a clicking noise, which is a loss of suction noise. That's an indication that there's something there's something going on. And it's not always a tongue tie. Sometimes it's oral dysfunction because maybe a baby has low tone in their cheeks. Um, this happens a lot when babies are premature, the fat pads aren't fully um, formed. And so there's different things we can do to help improve the function of the tongue, of the mouth to get that baby feeding more effectively at the breast. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good, you are welcome. Um, okay, I'm going to detour for a second and answer a question in the chat. When should you start pumping if, you if you've had low supply in the past? So good question. Um, first of all, we don't wanna start pumping when we're pregnant for a couple of reasons. A, you have colostrum that you started making um, around 14 weeks of gestation. It is in very, very, very small quantities. Um, so for example, when women who are tandem feeding babies, so like say they have an older kid that they're still nursing and they're pregnant, that baby that they're nursing is not gonna take all the colostrum and it's not gonna be gone. Your body will continue to make more, but it's still only gonna make a small amount because you it's not going anywhere. Like, especially if you're not nursing another baby, right? It's not going anywhere. So when baby's born and the placenta comes out, that's what triggers the milk to actually start being made to transition to the full on mature milk. So when you have low supply, um, my actual first recommendation would be to meet with an IBCLC um, to do a prenatal consult to see and like kind of look at your um, medical history, kind of understand what went on during your first um, breastfeeding experience to see if you can pinpoint what happened and then set a plan for pumping after the fact. I hesitate to give you um, just a start date on when you should start pumping if you had low supply in the past, because it could have been that you had, and I don't know your history, but it could have been that you had low supply because of um, a, an oral tie that a baby had, or maybe your flange didn't fit correctly. And that may not have been um, an issue with your medical history. For example, hormone disruption. So we think about PCOS or thyroid issues. Um, diabetes sometimes can impact um, our hormones and can make it so that our breast milk supply is a little bit low. Um, but it may not have been a medical issue. It may have been more what we call mismanagement of breastfeeding, not on your part, but on maybe the providers that you went to. Maybe they didn't know what was going on. Maybe they didn't understand breastfeeding and couldn't give you the recommendations to really help you get that, that milk supply up. So I would definitely recommend reaching out to a lactation consultant to look at your history and get a plan before the baby's born. Um, someone also asked, when do you recommend pumping before going back to work to build up a back stock of milk in preparation for daycare? So I'm actually going to send you all my pumping, my top pumping tips. Um, and this has it on there, depending on what your milk supply is like and assuming that you have a good supply, you don't need to start pumping, excuse me, necessarily until about two to three weeks before you go back to work and only one time a day, preferably in the morning. The morning is when we tend to have the most milk because our prolactin level, the milk making hormone spikes at night. So if you can pump in the morning, you might only get a few ounces, but if you do that seven days a week, that's 21 ounces, your baby doesn't need that much on the first day. And this is on the paper that I sent you, but your baby only needs half or sorry, one, to one and a half ounces per hour of separation. So for example, if you guys are apart for 10 hours, that's only 15 ounces. You don't need hundreds of ounces to cover that first day. Now, you might need more if for some reason you can't pump as much at work, or maybe you do have a low supply and so you wanna stock up, or maybe 
there's some other sort of extenuating circumstance that would be like, okay, yes, I'm going to need more than typical. And so let's start backing into it. So that gives you kind of a general idea and a general understanding, but again, it could be sp really specific to you. Um, okay, I talked about colostrum. Um, your milk should transition and come in around day three to five. Sometimes it takes um, a few days longer. Sometimes milk doesn't come in till day seven, in which case you might need to supplement with formula. Um, donor milk is also an option. If you have someone that you know and trust, um, you could get donor milk to supplement until then as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about feeling touched out. Having kids in general and having a breastfeeding baby means that your body is not only your own anymore for a little while. Even now when you're pregnant, you are growing a fetus. Um, that kid, that baby is going to want to be on you a lot. And it's okay if you feel touched out sometimes. It's okay if you are like, no, I just want to breastfeed, but man, when your partner gets home, you're like, Hey, please take the baby. Let me go shower in peace. Let me go take a walk. I need to just not be touched for a minute. That doesn't mean you're a bad mom. That means you're human. <laughs> that means you need some space and it's okay. And to that end too, some women have a hard time with breastfeeding because of the physical closeness for whatever reason. Um, and so maybe you choose to mostly pump and that is a valid way to feed your baby. Don't ever, ever, ever let anyone tell you that pumping, exclusively pumping specifically is not breastfeeding because it is breastfeeding. You are providing breast milk for your baby, okay? So to that end, I want you to understand that like this journey can look whatever way you want it to. You could decide that you want to breastfeed this many times a day and you want to supplement the rest with formula because that's what you want to do. You could decide that you want to exclusively breastfeed. You could decide you want to exclusively pump. It can be whatever you want it to be. And when I meet with someone, I make that very clear. My goal is to support you in whatever your goal is. And so give yourself the space and allow yourself the room um, to kind of think about that and kind of make specific goals about what you want to do. Um, but also understand that that goal might grow, change, however, however it might in the course of this journey. Has anyone seen the movie um, Encanto? Surely you have, right? Maybe you haven't if you don't have kids, but there's a song in there. I would actually encourage you to look it up. It's called Surface Pressure, and it's all about the weight of expectations. Um, and one line in the movie or one line in the song is something about um, if I could shake the weight of expectations, would it leave me room for joy or relaxation? And every time I hear this song, I think about moms. <laughs> Someone's just saying, yes, I think about moms and I think about the expectations and the pressures we put on ourselves. And while I, as a lactation consultant, think that exclusive breast milk feeding is amazing. I also think it's very important um, and probably more important to um, focus on mom's mental health and focus and make sure that mom is good. Because if you are exhausting yourself, physically, mentally with exclusive breastfeeding because you have whatever expectation you have, whether it's self-imposed or outside imposed, but then your mental health is suffering, then maybe that's not the best choice for you. So I say that not because I don't want you to breastfeed, but because I want you to remember that you matter, your mental health matters, and getting the support that you deserve matters, no matter what your goals are. So tangent, but I had to say it. Um, oh, okay. So someone mentioned you can ask the hospital or place you plan to deliver if they have a milk bank. Yeah, that's certainly um, doable. There is one in Kansas City. However, I heard a rumor it was closing. Um, I don't know why, probably something pandemic related, maybe staffing, but um, some hospitals do, well, 
my guess is the hospitals in Kansas City will be getting milk donated from milk banks throughout, you know, in different parts of the United States. But usually the milk, um, you can ask for it, but usually the milk coming from milk banks is reserved for NICU babies because um, they're the most fragile ones. And we know that NICU babies need the breast milk, not more than full-term babies, but it's usually less available for NICU babies. So keep that in mind as well. Um, all right, I'm gonna kind of skip around. Um, <clears throat> uh, someone is going to ask some questions. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna read. How to know if you have the correct flange <laughs> size, flange, F-L-A-N-G-E, close. How to deal with massive oversupply. Okay, yeah, so flange size. I actually have a, I was looking for my ruler. So flange size, I have this that I use in my office. I also have a actual measuring tape that is in millimeters, but when a mom comes to me, so these have numbers on them. This is literally just like an art supply, but it works for, for um, flange sizing. So what you would do, you can take a ruler in millimeters and measure at the base of your breast. And then that's your starting point. So for example, if you measure the diameter, diameter to be 19, you would want to go up uh, two millimeters and that's your starting point. Pumping shouldn't hurt. It should not be pinchy. It should not be causing you pain or any sort of nipple damage. Um, so I would recommend if you size yourself and you feel like you have the right size, but then um, you have issues later on, then reach out for help. Um, there is a nipple ruler on maymom.com, um, or you could just Google nipple ruler paper on Google and you should be able to come up with free ones. But everyone who comes to my office who needs help with pumping, I will size them. So let's see, this nipple is eh, about an 18. Most moms that I size are between a 15 and a 21. Your pump is gonna come with a 24 and a 27 or a 28 flange, which means your pump flange is probably too big, okay? Don't size yourself until you're closer to 36 weeks because we know that your nipples grow and change. And then you would want to probably resize after the baby's born, depending on how that flange is feeling that you actually got. Um, how to deal with massive oversupply. Oh, so this one's a little bit of a doozy. Again, it kind of goes with the low supply thing I was mentioning earlier. Um, understanding why you have an oversupply would be a, a good starting point. Um, it could be because of thyroid issues. Sometimes that happens. Um, sometimes you have an oversupply because your baby um, is not removing milk effectively. And so tongue ties and oral dysfunction can make moms have low supply and they can also make moms have oversupply. It sounds crazy, but it's just, I mean, it's so dependent on people's um, own bodies. So if you continue to have a massive oversupply, um, you could Google and try to DIY it, but honestly, you got to be careful because if you do it the wrong way, it could completely drop your supply too low. So I would recommend reaching out to a lactation consultant to get help um, to A, identify why we think you have oversupply and then B, to um, give you a solid plan to kind of control it without completely dwindling it, if that makes sense. Um, any tips for using Hakka or milk collection cups or shells? These are totally new to me, but recommended by friends. So the Hakka, I don't think I have one in here. I think I took it home, unfortunately, but it's just, you probably have heard of Hakka or seen the Hakka, just a little collection thing with a flange on top and it's silicone. We know that these are just collection, milk collectors, essentially. I don't even call it a pump because it's really not a pump. Um, when your breasts let down, so when you're feeding baby on one side, your breasts let down on both sides at the same time. So a collection shell or a haka would be nice to be used on the other side to catch the letdown. It's a great way to passively catch milk, um, especially if you leak a whole lot and then store it for later use. Um, 
A note on leaking. Some women leak during pregnancy or after baby comes and some women don't. And it's not an indication of what your breast milk supply is going to be like. So don't get inside your head. If you're not leaking now, it doesn't matter. If you don't leak later, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any impact on your milk supply. Uh, I see that Morgan sent the, the link for the May Mom Nipple Ruler. Thank you, Morgan. Some quick Googling. Um, okay, I'm gonna <clears throat> mention two other things and then I'm gonna make sure that you guys have what you need. So if you guys gotta hop off. So the one of the things I wanna mention is around cluster feeding. Cluster feeding is one of your baby nurses very frequently for a short period of time. Oftentimes this is in the evenings. And when I say very fre frequently, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be every half hour, it could be every 45 minutes, it could be every hour. A lot of times these cluster feeding times come around growth spurts because essentially baby is like, hey mom, today I ran a 5K and I had two cheeseburgers, but tomorrow I'm running a half marathon and I need five. So I'm putting in my order now to tell your body to make even more milk for tomorrow. So cluster feeding, hear me when I say, cluster feeding typically does not mean that you have a low supply. It typically means the baby is in some sort of growth spurt where something's going on that they need a little bit more milk for later on. Um, and then your milk supply will then downregulate a little bit after they're done with the growth or the cluster feeding. Caveat to that, like I mentioned before, if your baby, if you feel like your baby's feeding all the time and it goes on forever and ever, or if you're like, oh, this baby cluster feeds every single night and it's been happening for two weeks, then you need to get help and figure out what's going on. Because it could be something where they're just not removing enough milk and it could be hurting your milk supply. Um, cluster feeding often happens the second night of life. So we call it the second night syndrome. It often happens around the two week mark. That's the first big um, growth spurt. Also the time we expect baby to be back to birth weight by is two weeks. Happens often then around four weeks and around six weeks, two other big growth spurts. So kind of keep those in mind. Um, <clears throat> what to do, so someone's asking about what to do to avoid clogged ducts other than taking sunflower lecithin and breastfeeding pumping. So if you were having recurrent clogged ducts, off the top of my head, a couple reasons could be too restrictive of clothing. It could be that your baby wasn't removing milk as efficiently as um, he could be. So um, taking sunflower lecithin. So this is a, something that I literally just learned about like a couple days ago. Sunflower lecithin, we're learning over taking it long term. It can, it works to help. Um, get the fats broken down a little bit easier in the milk ducts and gets the milk moving a little bit easier, which was why it can help with uh, recurrent clogged ducts. But what we're learning is that continued and long-term use of sunflower lecithin can have a negative impact on mom's gut microbiome, which then in turn impacts baby's gut microbiome. So we know that the ingredient in sunflower lecithin um, that really helps is choline. And so looking at your choline consumption, consumption in the foods you eat, or maybe talking to your doctor and getting a supplement could help with that. Um, but I would say work with a lactation consultant to get to the basis of what's going on and why those clogged ducts continue to happen. Also making sure, again, no super restrictive clothing. If you're using a baby carrier, um, that's going to put restriction on your breast that can cause clogged ducts. So think about that as well. Um, I don't say not use a baby carrier, but just kind of keep it in mind. You got to, you got to give the girls room, like they got to have room to breathe a little bit and not be restricted all the time. Okay. The last thing I want to mention is that nursing baby to sleep is normal and natural. There's a lot of ideas around not only infant sleep, but also around this need to have babies eat, play, and then sleep. It is normal and natural for your baby to fall asleep with nursing. And sometimes that means baby falls asleep and they nap for two hours. Sometimes that, may be, that means baby falls asleep and they nap for 20 minutes. 
and they get a little cat nap, but it is very, very normal for babies to fall asleep when they're nursing. Um, especially whenever they're having a full nursing session, it's just like after you eat a big meal, you want to fall asleep. You don't want to go, you know, take a jog and play. Um, so keep that in mind. Infant sleep is difficult sometimes because it's a big shift going from being able to sleep as an adult to having this human that you have to take care of 24 seven and not getting enough sleep. So sleep is important. Um, there are ways to help you get more sleep while we are also protecting your milk supply and protecting baby's weight gain. So with that, um, if anyone has any other questions, I know we've, let's see, we've had about 40 minutes. If anyone has any other questions, throw them in the chat, but I wanted to make sure that I left you with an understanding of um, how I can help you. So I've kind of mentioned some ideas about like, if you have this, see a lactation consultant, if you have that. Um, so I can help with literally anything pertaining to lactation. So milk supply, latch, baby's weight gain, tongue and lip ties, weaning, bottles. Um, I actually just helped a formula feeding mom with her bottle, um, uh, with her bottle feeding the other day. So um, medicines that you're taking fast or slow let down, starting solids, literally like anything you can think pertaining to infant feeding. Um, I offer clinic visits here in my clinic across the hall from Morgan. I offer in-home visits and I also offer virtual visits. I do work with some insurances through a company called the Lactation Network. And if you're covered, it's up for six consults at no fee to you, which is huge. Those insurances uh, right now that they work with are Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem, Sigma, and United Health Care. So if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, or you can go to my website, which is nurturelactationkc.com, and there's info about how you can check your um, insurance coverage there. I also do prenatal courses, and those are also covered by the Lactation Network um, insurance covered visits, which is really awesome. I also have one topic videos that I'm building out. I just, I just started those recently, so I don't have a huge uh, list of those, but if you have questions or you have a topic you wanna see, let me know, and those are affordable. And then I have a, a back to work pumping course because us mamas who are going back to work uh, need a lot of help with that. So, okay, couple more questions I wanna grab. Want to hear more about ways to get more sleep while protecting milk. So the old cliche, sleep when the baby sleeps. It's so hard to do sometimes. Try to do that during the day, especially while you are at home um, with baby during maternity leave. Um, if you are considering uh, bed sharing. So again, a little bit controversial in our society, Everywhere else in the world, people bed share without issue. It's common, it's normal. In our society, we look down on it, but um, bed sharing can actually help moms who breastfeed get more sleep. The research shows that. And so if you do it safely, it can be perfectly fine. Um, <clears throat> I am not the expert on infant sleep. Um, but we know that making sure that baby is close. So as they recommend having baby in the same um, room as you, that's going to help you to get more sleep because you don't have to get up and go to a different room, get baby, sit up, blah, 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 blah. Um, or maybe you get up, feed the baby, and then your partner is the one who does the diaper change and you go back to sleep. Or maybe when baby wakes up, your partner goes and gets the baby brings them to you and then takes them back. Um, basically ways to help you not wake up as much. All right, so someone mentioned they had a lot of anxiety because their son wasn't gaining enough weight and I had no way of measuring how much he was getting any advice there. So good question. The main way you're gonna know at home about if your baby's getting enough is looking at the diaper output. So after day five of life, you want, to, or sorry, after day four of life, you want to see three to four poops a day and five to six wets a day. 
um, without doing a weighted feed for 24 hours with a scale, an expensive scale that measures down to a certain level, you're not going to know with every single feeding what baby is getting. I will say this, if you continue to have those issues after uh, the next baby is born, there's probably something going on. It's not your milk. I will say it's not your milk. Your milk is literally perfect. 99% of the time when a baby is having breasts or when a baby is having weight gain issues, it's because the volume of milk is not high enough. So please don't let anyone ever tell you that your milk is not good enough. You cannot look at milk and say it doesn't have enough fat or calories. You cannot look at a baby and say, oh, your baby, your milk doesn't have enough fat or calories. You can't know that by looking at milk. You would have to go send it off and get it tested, which is usually not, not necessary. I've never had anyone had to do it yet. So um, <clears throat> I would definitely make sure you have um, someone on speed dial to call um, who is a professional to come over and assess and figure out why your baby wasn't gaining weight or if you have weight gain issues, what's going on. And then the last question is, if my hypothyroidism is treated, do you anticipate that I'll have issues? Anything proactive approach I should take? So typically if hypothyroidism is treated and it's been well managed for a long time, um, oftentimes it's not an issue. Um, that's not the case for everyone. Again, I would have a lactation consultant on speed dial should you see that your milk supply is low or suspect that your supply is low so that you can figure out ways to manage that. Um, but a lot of times when it's been well managed, it's not an issue. So that's all I have for you guys today. It was a lot, I know. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and listen. I hope you learned something. I hope you feel a little more empowered than you did 45 minutes ago. So awesome. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Seriously. I mean, I learned a ton. I'm sure <laughs> it seems like the girls did too. And like I said, this is recorded. So you guys can rewatch it. I'm sure you're going to want to and take some notes. I will also get those handouts Sarah is talking about from her so that I can upload them for you guys. Um, and yeah, use her, you guys. It's so funny to hear her talk. And I feel like there's so many similarities uh, to pelvic PT during pregnancy. Like, oh, I didn't, you know, know I should do that. Or I didn't know this should be painful. And it's the same thing. If we, our goal as providers is to start getting you guys the information earlier and to have a group like this that wants it is our bread and butter. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. I'm going to stop the recording here.